Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song, his cornerstone, his solid ground. Firm through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. And good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship here at New Bedford Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Welcome to all of you who are online today as well. Uh, welcome to Antonio and Maram, who are joining us this morning, too, for the first time this, uh, this, this uh, in what's going to be many Sundays together. I want to share with you uh, some announcements this morning uh, for your information. Uh, I want to double check. I don't see our, the chair of our committee there, but I see... Um, I want to make sure the administration committee for tomorrow night is meeting at 7 o'clock. Is that right? 7 o'clock? Is it still 8 o'clock? It is 7 o'clock, Gary? All right, so 8 o'clock. Uh, okay, 8 o'clock it is. Good. All right, so, we, so we've established that. Uh, also, we have, of course, on Wednesday, we have a WANA uh, choir rehearsal, handbell rehearsal. Uh, book chat is continuing, which is exciting. Uh, two times on Thursday, 10 o'clock in the morning and uh, 6 o'clock at night. And, of course, worship committee, I believe, is also meeting 6.30 on Thursday as well. And book chat, once again, is meeting at 10 o'clock. And, uh, and I'm going to go to Steve in just a minute for this other announcement, so I'll hold off on that for a moment. I uh, also want to remind you of what's taking place October the 22nd, the Simple Gifts Choir doing Our Father, A Journey Through the Lord's Prayer. That's going to be at 4 o'clock here in this church, so please make note of that. And are there any other announcements for the good of the body? Oh, we have two. There we go. Okay. There we go, Gina. You're welcome. Good morning. Um, just wanted to say that the CPR class is full. So we will talk to them about doing another one. And as a reminder, that's Monday at 6 o'clock at the church, the 16th. And then, sorry, I like ran. <laughs> that's okay. That's all right. <laughs> um, October 21st, we are having a tailgating celebration here. We're going to have some football, some yard games. Hopefully we can have some people sign up for a potluck. Um, just to bring the two services together, and that's on the 21st at 3 p.m. There will be a sign-up sheet. Okay, thank you very much for that, and we're also hoping that the Steelers actually do have a winning record by that point. We'll see what happens with it. Steve. Good morning. This is to all the men. Um, for the past two or three months, we've talked about joining a group. Well, men's ministry meets the second Saturday of every month, which is next Saturday. We meet here at 8 o'clock. So everyone, if you ever wanted to stick your toe into a small growth group, this is it. This is your chance. It's only for an hour and a half, once a month, guys. It's, it's very easy. Um, this Saturday, 8 o'clock, we will meet here at the church. We do breakfast. So we ask you, if you are coming, to bring something to share for a change. Harry and I usually provide, but we thought this month, um, everybody that's coming that would bring something to provide. You could cook something. You can pick up some donuts. If you can get Perfect. your wife to, to bake something, whatever, um, just bring something to share. Um, the meeting is only about an hour, an hour and a half, but this month we will discuss as a group um, what we are, what direction we are going to take in the men's ministry, what we'd like to study, a video series, a book, or whatever, the Bible. So uh, this Saturday, 8 o'clock here at the church. Right. Thank you very much, Steve. Any other announcements while I have the microphone in my hand? Um, hearing none, let us... Come to our Lord in a time of prayer to prepare our hearts, and then we will do the call to worship. So let us pray. Lord God, we are thankful today. Thankful, Lord God, that, that we can be in this place. And Lord God, we know that people are bringing burdens with them. They're bringing celebrations with them. They're bringing all kinds of things with them today, Lord. And so we pray that you would enable them by the power of your Holy Spirit to, to lay those at your feet, that they might just be filled to overflowing with you. Lord God, we pray and pray and plead for this every single Sunday. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill our hearts and fill our lives. In your name, Jesus, I pray. 
Amen. And let's stand now for the call to worship. This is taken from Psalm 36 this morning, and let's say this together. Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your justice like the great deep. O Lord, you preserve both man and beast. How priceless is your unfailing love. Both high and low among men find refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Let us worship God. Whoa! 
just give you praise today for who you are, Lord God. You are the, the rock of our lives. Lord, you are the cornerstone of our lives. Lord God, we need not be afraid of anything today because of you. Lord God, we worship you today for who you are as we're gonna see revealed in the sermon today for the amazing thing that you've done. In your name, Jesus, I pray, amen. God, I'm sorry. Let me, let me get adjusted with my stuff here. It's a privilege to be here on this morning. God is in this place. The word of God says when two or three are gathered in his name, there is he in the midst. And he's here today, church. And there's no other place we'd rather be. I don't know about you, but I'd rather be in the house of the Lord. God. 
have your way in this place, Father God. Can we just get our minds on the Lord this morning? I love this song because it's saying God is our cornerstone. He's our firm foundation for everything. Sing that again, church. One more time. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less. Yes, that's it. Then Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's cross. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems face I rest on his unchanging grace through every high and stormy gale my anchor holds within the veil my anchor holds within the veil the church. Hey, yes, God. And the save is love. Have your way, Jesus. Oh, yes. Through the storm. Lord of all. Come on, sing it again, church. Christ alone. Hey. Cornerstone. The weak made strong. Righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. Christ alone, Christ alone. Yes, church. Cornerstone. Hallelujah. We made strong. Yes, God. Through the storm. Church, one more time. Christ alone. Oh, yes. Cornerstone. Weak made strong. Yeah. And the same is love. Through the storm. He is Lord. Lord of all. Yes, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. 
Thank you, God, for this time. I just want to share this, and I'm going to get out the way, but I love the words of this song because, you know, that there's that saying, you build your house on sand, it'll fall. But you build your house on the Lord, it'll stand. And I know that when I gave my life to Christ, you know, he was my firm foundation. You know, my life was all unstable, all over the place. But when I gave my life to the Lord and decided to live for him wholeheartedly, is when my life stood up. I was able to take more blows. The wind may blow, but it didn't blow my house away. And I'm, I'm just praying this over somebody today, that if he's not your firm foundation, if he's not your cornerstone, make him your cornerstone today. This is, your, this is the atmosphere for God to move on your behalf. Whatever you've been praying for, whatever you need from God, he wants it for you. But we all have an enemy that's trying to keep us from God and his power, his anointing for us to be free. But today I just decree that there's freedom in the house of God today. There's freedom in this place. You don't have to be worried about your sin and what you've done. God is going to set you free if you just open up your hearts. Christ alone, cornerstone, the weak made strong. Don't worry about the person behind you, around you. It's you and God in this place. Let's turn our attention to God. He is Lord. Come on, if you, do, if you believe that, decree it. Here we go. Christ alone. Oh, yes, Christ alone. Cornerstone. Yes, Jesus. Through the storm. He is Lord, yes. One more time, church. Christ alone, yes, God. seated. As we come to our Lord now in a time of prayer, let us pray. Mighty God, you're present in this place. We praise you, Lord, for so many things, for your mighty power, Lord, that forged the universe they created the mountains, Lord, and the rivers, and everything else. We praise you, Lord, for your majesty. Lord, when we look at those majestic mountains, they are just a hint, Lord, of your majesty. When we see you face to face, Lord, we praise you today, Lord, for your precision, Lord. As Calvin said, Lord, all one need do is look at the miracle of a human body to see, Lord God, that you are a God who works miracles in the lives of us. And so, Lord, today we give you thanks as well. We give you thanks, Lord, for your love. We give you thanks for love, the gift that you gave us for each other, but also, Lord, the love you poured out for us, as we're gonna talk about today. We give you thanks, Lord, for friends and for family through which we can, Lord God, feel that love and express that love, express your love. We give you thanks today, Lord, for speaking to us by your word. And Lord God, today, as we reflect back on this last week, we wanna think about, Lord, and give you thanks, Lord, for specific things that you have done in our lives today, Lord God. We pause now and we give those thanks to you from the bottom of our hearts. Lord, 
as we give you thanks today, we also, Lord God, need to confess. Lord God, we are sinners saved by grace as we're going to learn in the message today. Lord, we confess that we've had thoughts that you wouldn't have, that we've, Lord, expressed words, Lord, that you wouldn't say, that, Lord, we've done deeds that you wouldn't do. Lord, we, we declare before you that we do live, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so, Lord, hear us now as from the silence of our hearts we bring those private and personal confessions to you. Lord, we repent of all these things. And we also think about Romans 6.23, Lord, that tells us the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And so, Lord God, today we pray. We pray intercessory prayers for others and petitions for ourselves. Lord God, we pray for Zach, Lord, who, whose meds were changed for his ulcerative colitis, and we pray, Lord, that the med change would not affect his health. We pray for Jimmy, a groom who had to be hospitalized just before his wedding for his healing, Lord. Lord, I pray for our friend Brandon, Lord, who had that football injury on Friday night, and pray for his healing. Pray for Janine's brother, Denny, Lord, who has been diagnosed with a rare form of leukemia. Lord God, that you would provide healing there. We pray for all of those who are battling disease, Lord God. We pray for those battling cancer, Lord, Lord, battling diverticulitis, those battling, Lord, diabetes, those battling, Lord, shoulder and aches and pains, heart disease, whatever it might be, Lord, we pray your healing hand to be upon each of them. We know with but a word, Lord God, you can speak it, and it would be so. We pray, Lord, for marriages and relationships that are in trouble, Lord God. We pray, Lord, that you would bring warring parties together, Lord that you would put your peace upon it. We pray, Lord, for this world, with wars and rumors of wars continuing to go on in this world, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that you would, you would bring peace to those who are battling each other. You tell us to pray for our leaders, Lord. We know this nation is in trouble. And so, Lord, we pray for those leaders, for President Biden, Lord, for, for the House of Representatives, which has been in turmoil this past week. Lord, for, for the Senate, for the Supreme Courts, for state legislatures, Lord, thinking especially of the state legislatures of Ohio and Pennsylvania, for the governors, Lord, of those two states, Governor Shapiro in Pennsylvania, Governor DeWine in Ohio. And Lord God, we ask now that you would hear the personal petitions for ourselves or intercessory prayers we have for others as we list them now silently to you. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you heard every single one of those prayers. We pray them, remembering, Lord, the words that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As I'm going to share with you in just a couple of moments, this is going to be one of the more pivotal messages in this sermon series. And so to, to set this up this morning, I've asked, I've asked Antonio and the praise team to sing something which really talks to what the message is going to talk about today. A Chris Tomlin song that you might be familiar with, Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. Thank you, brother.
cleansing grace, how sweet the sound that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Chains are gone, I've been set free. Yes, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. My God, my Savior, has ransomed me. Has ransomed me. Like the flood, yeah. Like the flood. His mercy reigns. His mercy reigns. Unending love. Amazing. My Savior, my God, my Savior, has ransomed me, has ransomed me. like a flood. Like flood. His mercy reigns, His mercy reigns, an ending love. Amazing love. Amazing Go ahead, Justin. Shall we give hand praise to God this morning? Amen. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, Antonio. Thank you, Maram. Welcome to our church. Thank you for bringing what you're bringing here today too. Praise God. Praise God. And so this morning, I have uh, been praying for this message for a couple of weeks now. 
because I think that uh, what this is is the moment in, uh, in the book of Romans. So there have been some incredible speeches that have been done in this, uh, in this world by our, by our nation's leaders. I think back to World War II, for example, and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt saying to the nation at the height of World War II, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. I think of uh, John F. Kennedy with a new generation of Americans coming up in, in 1960 at the inauguration and saying, ask not what you can do for your, for, for your, for what, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I think of Martin Luther King Jr. who looked at his little children and he said, I have a dream of a day when my children will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And I think about Ronald Reagan's trip in the late 1980s to the, to East Berlin and saying to the Soviet Premier, Mikhail Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, if you seek the liberalization of your country, Mr. Gorbachev, come to this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. And it was. Those are inspiring words, folks. But today, you are going to hear words that, as one theologian said, don't just represent life change but represent a change of reality for all of us. We're coming now to the pivotal sermon in our sermon series that we've been calling All Roads Lead to Rome. The whole concept behind this has been that, that all the great ideas, all the, the core beliefs of the Bible are contained in this one book. Theologians call it doctrine. All the doctrine contained in the Bible is, is found, finds its hub inside this book. And today, we're going to be looking at the most core doctrine, the most core belief of all, the pivot points for our entire Christian faith. So far in this sermon series, we have learned as, as God inspired the Apostle Paul to, to write to the, uh, the churches in Rome that were composed of both Jewish Christians and also Gentile Christians, we've learned for our own selves the state of our nation and our world and why we need Jesus. We talked last week about the need to, to have a humble attitude when we interact with the world. Well, today we're going to talk about life-changing words, words that if you've been drifting in your faith, I pray speak to you afresh today, words that if you have not had a faith, will bring you to faith today by the power of the Holy Spirit. We've looked at chapter one, we've looked at chapter two. Today, chapter three, I would dare say the most important words in all the Bible. And so for those of you who'd like to follow along in your own Bible, open it now to Romans chapter three, verses 21 through 31. Those of you who like to follow the Pew Bibles, that's where you can go to, go to there. Those of you who like to walk to the message notes or the screens, that's where we're going, as God inspired the Apostle Paul to write these life-changing words. He's speaking to the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians. He's just finished speaking about how important it is to realize that the law, the first five books of the Bible and the prophets, which is what they had back then, were there not to, not to, to pave your way to heaven, but to, were to point out your sinful nature, and why you need something else. And then he says this, but now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, those first five books of the Bible, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is the boasting? 
it is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the God of Jews only, meaning Jewish Christians? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, of you and me. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith, meaning Jewish Christians, and the uncircumcised by the same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. God's very word to us today. Pray with me, please. And so, Lord, today, my prayer, Lord, is that you would take these complicated concepts and translate them to our lives in a way, Lord, that brings about life change, that is, Lord, a reflection of these life-changing words. And it's in your name, Jesus, that I do pray. Amen. And so today we're going to be taking a look at six crucial concepts that are found in these life-changing words today. Two of these we've already kind of talked about, glanced at before in a previous message, but four of these are going to be brand new to us as we explore these. And so the first crucial concept, for those of you who like to keep those message notes, the first crucial concept is this. Don't think you can work your way to God because you can't. You just can't do it. You know, you talk to a lot of people. I, I, I've talked to a lot of people in, in pre-marriage counseling and, and others, other venues, and they, they say things, something like this. You know, I've tried to be a good person. I've tried, to, I've tried to live by the golden rule. God would have to let me in. No, he wouldn't. The Jewish Christians thought themselves, you know, we have these first five books of the Bible. We have, we have the prophets. We have Isaiah. We have Jeremiah and all of this. Surely if we know this, we've earned our way in. No. What does Paul say inspired by God in verse 21? He says, now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known. As a matter of fact, we find out this as we read through this more deeply. As we go back into the, to the 20th verse, we didn't read that this morning. We're going to read it now. What was the law there for? What were those five, first five books of the Bible and the sacrificial system and everything else in, there, in place for? Verse 20b talks to us about that. It says this. It says, through the law, we become conscious of sin. We become conscious of the fact that we can't work our way to God. The Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul discovered this. Remember the Apostle Paul's history. He was a, he was a Pharisee. He was a person who knew the law inside and out. He was a person who went after this bizarre cult, he called it at the time, called Christianity, arrested people, watched as people were, were tortured and murdered for their faith. He did all of that. But then on that Damascus road, God got hold of his heart. Jesus spoke to him directly saying, why are you persecuting me? And Paul was changed. And Paul came to understand something that we need to understand. That that entire Old Testament, it actually points to Jesus. He says in verses 22, uh, 21b through, through 22a, he says this. He talks about the law to Jesus to which the law and the prophets testify. Then he says, this righteousness comes from God through faith in Jesus to all who believe. How you're made right with God is not by trying to good deed your way to God. It's not possible to do so. You can't. You're made right with God through Jesus. In the Old Testament, when you start thinking of it that way, it, it just opens it up for you. The law, Genesis chapter 22, a promise God made to Abraham. As you think about the entire Old Testament pointing to Jesus, it starts to open up for you. God said to Abraham, I will surely bless you and make your descendants, the Israelites, as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies. They'll go to the promised land. But here's the phrase, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. A lot of people read that and think that's plural. That's all the Israelites. You look at it in the original language, that's singular. One offspring, one person. It's pointing to Jesus for the earthly family tree of Jesus came through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then we come to the prophecies, the prophets that they all read. Isaiah 53 
speaks about what Jesus does after the suffering of his soul, the cross. He will see the light of life and be satisfied, risen from the dead. Now we see it. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, which is what we're talking about today. And he will, he will bear their iniquities. And so a first crucial concept is you can't work your way to God. And it leads to the second crucial concept, which we've also hinted at before, which is this. Don't think you're better than the next guy because you aren't. And here's the phrase that can convict all of us. Romans 3, 23. For all have sinned. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Jewish Christians who had all that tradition and the law and everything else fell short of the glory of God. The Gentile believers who believed perhaps they could just be good to people because now they're Christians, they fall short of the glory of God. I, on a weekly basis, fall short of the glory of God. And I know all of you fall short on a weekly basis for the, of the glory of God. We all fall short in our lives of the, of the glory of God. Bible scholars will tell us that in God's eyes, your sin and the sin of the most despicable person you can think of are equal in God's eyes. Because to God, sin is sin is sin. You know, if, uh, if, if you take that pen home from the office, you've sinned. And it's equal to, it's hard to believe, but it's equal to all those, those horrible individuals in Philadelphia who looted all those stores that we saw in the news a couple of weeks ago. Our sins considered to be exactly the same in, in God's eyes, completely to, to be the same. But I also want to thank James Montgomery Boyce for pointing something else. And I want to go back now to, to verse 21a and have you look at it again. Verses 21a says this, but now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known. If you like circling words in your message notes, you might want to circle, but now, but now, but now everything's changed. But now your life direction has changed. But now your past is erased, it's changed. But now your future is guaranteed, it's changed. All thanks to Jesus. Jesus became the pivot point that changed your history and my history forever. And it leads to a, a third crucial concept in here. Do believe like a slave in the marketplace, you have been freed. Some of the congregation love to be able to study the real depth uh, theological ideas. And so for those of you who like to study in depth, I'm looking at my buddy Steve over there today when I think of that. These next verses are going to talk about redemption and uh, propitiation and justification. For those of us who just want to know about God's plan, these next sections are absolutely awe-inspiring, can cause you to fall down on your knees and, and weep when you realize that when you truly take it to heart. The phrase in verse 24, justified freely by his grace through redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Those of you who like to circle things in your message notes, you circle the word redemption there. That comes from an ancient Greek word. And again, the New Testament is written, is written in Greek. And the Greek word was a word to describe slaves in the marketplace. As I was researching for this sermon, I found out of all interesting things that if you looked at the population of the city of Rome back then in the first century, there were more slaves in Rome than there were Roman citizens. And there were millions of people in Rome back then. More slaves than there were, than there were Roman citizens. But then you also think about the fact that back in, in Jewish culture, that uh, there were folks who had a debt they couldn't pay off, and so they had to go into slavery for a period of time until their debt was paid. Now, in light of Jesus, we start to see a little bit about what this is all about. That when Jesus went to the cross, he actually paid our debt, the debt of sin that we had, and freed us from slavery to sin. But then we get this word, propitiation. And that also comes into play 
we look at the fourth, sorry, I lost my, lost my microphone here. There we go. Got too excited. The fourth crucial concept is this. It's that you can do believe, do believe like a criminal on trial, you've been declared not guilty. Here's where propitiation and justification comes into play. So I want you to picture, last week I wore robes for communion. I want to picture, picture a judge, maybe from Ohio or maybe from Pennsylvania, wearing, wearing robes. Um, only he's not a judge that was elected by the people. He's actually a, a perfect judge. He's an absolutely holy judge. And as a perfect and holy judge, if he sees a crime that's been committed, if he's a perfect, holy, righteous judge, he must punish that crime. He has to do it. So now we go back to, to, to this phrase once again. And we think about the fact that, that you and I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 6 talks about this. What's the penalty for our sin? The wages of sin, it says, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Propitiation is a fancy word that means that God, by sending Christ to earth and by Jesus going to the cross, he appeased God's wrath. Justice had to be satisfied. Had to be satisfied. And so Jesus satisfied it. He became our atonement. He, he took the hit for us. And in doing so, he justified us. Justified is a legal term. It's a legal term in which basically the death sentence has been pronounced, but, uh, but then the judge takes off his robes and he walks to the defendant's table he pushes you and me out of the way. He says, yeah, the death sentence has been passed, but, but I'm going to take the, the payment for this. I'm going to be the one who, who takes this on. I, I'm going to appease the, the need for justice by, by being the sacrifice. And so God can look at us and say, not guilty. Justified is a, is a fancy word that means just as if I never sinned. Folks, if you take these three concepts together, maybe we've never separated them out before in a sermon, I don't know. But if you take these three concepts together, freed you from slavery to sin, appeased the justice that was required for your sin, and declares you not guilty, when you truly take into your heart and your soul that concept, my goodness gracious, it opens up exactly what Jesus did for us. It opens up exactly what your life can be thanks to him. Your chains are gone. They're not there anymore. You, you've been freed. I have a, somebody in my life who's very dear to me who used to be a, 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 a railway conductor and a railway engineer. And I learned about engines and linchpins and, and everything else. And so think about the freight on a freight train as being the weight of everything that you carry, your past, all your mistakes, the fears that you have. We're no longer slaves to fear. We're children of God. Think of all that freight and think of the engine. The engine is Jesus and his freeing you from slavery to sin, his taking the wrath of God, the justice needed to be meted out and his declaring you not guilty. That's the linchpin that enables you to drive forward in life, in life with the engine of Christ and for that freight to get lighter and lighter and lighter. It makes verse 31 make sense to us now in which verse 31 says this, do we nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. But I want to share with you something else, too, because this one, you know, one of the things I love about the Bible is that you can read it over, the, over and over, year after year after year, and you start to see something new. And uh, Lee in our staff study a couple of weeks ago on these passages said something. He said, you ever notice that how in Romans chapter 11, or, or not Romans chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, for those of you who like to study the Bible, that lists the heroes of the faith, those who are considered heroes in, in God's eyes. And it lists people like Abraham and, and Moses and David. They're considered to be heroes of the faith. 
And Lee pointed out something. He said, you ever notice that God doesn't mention their crimes when he calls them heroes of the faith? Doesn't mention that, that Abraham slept with his wife's slave and, and gave birth to, to Ishmael? Doesn't mention that, uh, that Moses killed an Egyptian guard and had to flee for his life? Doesn't mention that King David committed adultery and then to cover it up when he, when he got Bathsheba pregnant, arranged for the murder of, of Bathsheba's wife, Uriah? Doesn't mention that. Why? Verse 25b points this out for us. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Jesus' work on the cross goes forward in time to affect you and me, but it also goes backward in time to, to affect Abraham and, and, and Moses and David so that when God looks at them now, they're declared not guilty. It's as, it's as, as if they've never sinned. And that's why their sins are not mentioned in the book of Hebrews. And all of this comes together and our response to this is actually the fifth and crucial, fifth and crucial concept for you, which is this. Do believe, do realize the key to life is faith in all of this. That's the key. It's faith in all of this. What's faith? That same Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11 spoke to this. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says this. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. John Calvin, the father of Reformed theology, the father of Presbyterianism, said that, uh, that you get faith by being knowledgeable in God's word, his special revelation to us, and having the Holy Spirit move it in your heart, and then wanting to follow Jesus as a result of this. That's what faith is all about. Faith is understanding what we talk about every week with the three circles. Faith is understanding three circles for me, Nate, if you don't mind. Faith is understanding this, that you're broken. You and I are broken apart from Jesus. And we can try all kinds of different things to, to heal that brokenness, but it just, it just ain't gonna work because the sin is too great. The separation from God's original design is just too great. But Jesus came to earth. God came to earth as Jesus and he, and he came to us and talked to us about life and then became the, the freedom for us. He took, he redeemed us from slavery by the cross. He atoned for our sins by the cross. He, he got us declared not guilty before God because of the cross. Absolutely amazing. And, and, then, and then this, he gave us the Holy Spirit so we could recover and pursue God's design for us. And so it leads to a, a sixth in most important crucial concept, which is this. Knowing this, do know that your role is to proclaim this to everybody. Here's what, what verses 27 through 30 say. Where then is the boasting, Jewish Christians? It's excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, that of faith. We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there's only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised by faith as well. And this is what you need to proclaim to people. This is the hope that we have. There have been great speeches in this country. I think about the Gettysburg Address by Abraham Lincoln at the height of the Civil War. But folks, there are no more important words than Romans chapter three. My prayer for those of you who have drifted in the faith is that you will take those words to heart in a way that you haven't before and you realize the extent of what he did. It's not just one thing, it's numerous things. It's love poured out for you and for me. It's the definition of love. It's the definition of the promise of God. My prayer for you today is that you will realize that all roads do lead to Rome because this is it. This is what the Christian faith is all about. And this is what you need to proclaim with the three circles. You know, the problem with the Jewish Christians was this, that they didn't wanna share it with the Gentile Christians because they thought they were superior. The challenge we have is this. We have this challenge that because of way, the way the world is, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago in a message, because of the way the world is, 
we just want to be able to hide in our churches and, and, and not share with people because the world's a mess. But Jesus said this when he walked the earth. He, he said this in, in the Gospel of Matthew. He said, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp, the faith given to you, and place it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to every single person in the house. And in the same way, we are to let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds, your faith and trust in your Father in heaven. All paths, all roads lead to Rome, but from Rome, you branch out and touch a world that needs Jesus. Pray with me, please. Lord God, we stand in awe of you, Lord. You are truly Amazing. What we need, Lord, is you. What the world needs is you. I pray for the person here or listening online who's not known you as Savior, that today this pivotal passage from the letter to the Romans will have spoken to their hearts and they'll see what you did in a whole new light. For those, Lord, who've been drifting away because life has gotten in the way. I pray, Lord, that these words, these life-changing words will have spoken afresh to their heart that they can recommit themselves to you today. Lord, as we go out into the world with our faith, as we bump into folks who think that you're a myth, a fairy tale, and everything else, pray, Lord, that you would remind us that you are in us by the Holy Spirit and as we encounter barbs and arrows for our faith, that we can know in you, Christ alone, we can make our stand. To you be the glory, Lord Jesus. Amen. And let us stand and sing. Thank you. 
now you know, again, the truth that can set you free. Go in peace. Go in love. And smile. And walk. And dance with Jesus today. And all God's people said, Amen. Praise God.